Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, this morning, we're gonna talk about local road safety plans in Kentucky. Uh, local road safety plans are a relatively new initiative in, um, in Kentucky. Uh, right now, we've got three counties that volunteer to be pilot counties, and uh, we're getting very close to wrapping those up. And so we want to share some of our experiences from those, share some of the benefits uh, that you can get through the local road safety plans. And uh, then we're also giving an overview of how we're approaching them, which varies a little bit differently from how some other states. So I know we have uh, some people from out of state as well. So hopefully this has got uh, some benefits. Somebody can take something away uh, from this as we go through it. Uh, I will say that if anybody has any questions as uh, we go through, uh, feel free to type it in the chat pod. Uh, Nicole will be monitoring that. So if you have any questions, uh, put that in there. I've got it up as well so I can see it if you, you've got something. And if we end up missing you, then go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and feel free to interrupt me as uh, we go along. Uh, you won't throw me off. So no problem with that. Uh, today also, uh, going to be joining me is going to be Nathan Ridgeway, and he's going to give a short perspective on the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet's uh, view of the local road safety plans, and then how also these are going to be critical as we go forward in being eligible for highway safety improvement funds uh, in order to meet some of uh, our demands for our local roadways. So we'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is we'll just give a real brief overview of Kentucky, some of the challenges we face, some of the things that make us a little bit different than other states. We'll uh, go through the uh, local road safety plan steps and, and procedures and kind of what it looks like. Uh, you'll notice as we go through this, I've tried to highlight where there's information that we're pulling together in the local road safety plan that we've already got available for um, for all of the counties and we can pull it for cities and things like that. So uh, part of this is uh, through our safety circuit rider program as well, which provides technical assistance to the local governments. Uh, so as we're going through the local road safety plan process, I want you to realize that there's a lot of resources that we've that were identifying that are being incorporated into the local road safety plan that are available right now. So if you have a question about your crash data, if you have a question about what kind of improvements and all uh, you should put, but you don't want to go through an entire safety plan at this stage, we're still there to help you. And so we'll kind of show you what information is available. Uh, we'll show you, you know, some of the steps that you can take um, to gather some additional information. And then at the end of it, we'll give you some of our contact information and how you can participate with the Safety Circuit Rider Program or the Local Road Safety Plan Program uh, at the University of Kentucky Tran Technology Transfer Program. So uh, that's kind of what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, like I said, anybody has any questions, feel free to stop me and uh, we'll go, uh, go from there. So looking at Kentucky, you know, one of our, our challenges is that we've just got a lot of counties. Um, while that has a lot of benefits where you have local government that's truly local that understands uh, you know, who's there, what that also does is it puts a lot of demand on uh, each of those individual counties in order to address their roadway. So we don't want every county road department, uh, all of our county engineers who are maintaining over 52,000 miles of local roadways we don't want them to have to reinvent the wheel every time they try and develop a safety plan. So what we're hoping to do with the local road safety plan is give a structure and a process that everybody can follow and we're there through the technology transfer program to help you along with that uh, so that you're not on your own. So that, that's one of the problems with all of these counties is that you know we don't wanna keep reinventing the wheel. And I think that uh, the local road safety plan tries to identify uh, a process that can be adapted for locals uh, for your individual needs, but it also follows that process that uh, takes some of the question marks out of how do you get started and how do you get going uh, through that. So Kentucky, uh, we've got about 80,000 miles of total roadways, uh, 27,000 miles of that is state maintained. And so that leaves you know, just under 52,000 miles of, of local roadways. Um, of those 52,000 miles, only about 52 of those are major minor collector roadways or uh, the kind of a higher order road. 
And why that's significant is that when we look at our crashes, we usually have pretty good luck if we say we've got a lot of crashes. If we hit our major and minor collector roadways, we can focus on those and it kind of limits the area that we can address. But when we look over at our uh, county road system, we've only got about 13% of our total fatalities in the state on our roadways, on our local roadways. And those 13% are spread out over, uh, you, you know, those are spread out over 52,000 miles of roadway. So it really, when we say, how do we reduce our fatal crashes? How do we reduce our high severity crashes? On our state system, we're dealing with about half as many roadways and a lot more crashes. So we can really use good crash data in order to identify these locations. We can see where are the hot spots occurring. But when we move over to our local roads, we've got crashes kind of scattered throughout the state. And so that's really one of the big challenges that we've got when we're dealing with local road crashes is how do we identify where those improvements go? Because we don't have the funding to say, well, we're just gonna go and improve all 52,000 miles of roadway. Um, maybe eventually we're gonna get there. I don't know if it's gonna be uh, during my career, but uh, at this point we need to find a way, how can we identify what are our most hazardous roadways? Where are the crashes likely to occur? across this vast local road system. So that's really what the local road safety plan does is it tries to uh, identify where should we be focusing our effort. And one of the things that I always say with the local road safety plans is we're not really trying to change what you're doing. We're just trying to change the priority in which we do it. And when we change that priority, we're not changing your job description. We're not changing you know, how we do it, but instead of being reactive and going out and saying, well, we had a complaint, so we're gonna go put up a sign on this roadway. Hopefully we've already identified those issues or we might've identified more important issues that we should be addressing first. So that's the root of the local road safety plan. A couple of things that uh, we have, uh, the state of Kentucky puts together a strategic highway safety plan and within that highway safety plan, what they identify are emphasis areas. So these are areas when we look at it in the state, we see um, areas that we need to improve upon. You know, this is where uh, major contributors to our crashes are going. And we, you can see we've got aggressive driving, distracted driving, impaired driving, and occupant protection. So a lot of these are really behavioral. And if you study crashes, you know that there is a lot of behavior that goes into making a safe roadway and having motorists travel safely on the roadway. But if you look down at uh, the bottom two, we're looking at roadway departure and our vulnerable users. And those roadway departure crashes, those are one of the few things where we know that we've got problems on our roadway. We know that there are some roads that could be improved that if we improve them, we can really mitigate those crashes. And so roadway departure is probably the number one in Kentucky of where we see a lot of these crashes, where a lot of our fatal crashes come from. And that's also where we see a lot of the fatal crashes that occur on our local roads. So this is really statewide, those roadway departure and rural road safety is one of those high uh, things that we look at. Uh, just to give you some statistics, and this is straight out of the highway safety uh, strategic plan. Uh, if you look at Kentucky right up here, compared to our bordering states, our roadway departure crashes are uh, second highest and we're leading quite a few other states in terms of uh, some of our contributing factors. Uh, one other notable uh, thing, if you look at occupant protection uh, in our fatal crashes uh, on roadway departures, 35% aren't wearing seatbelts. Whereas if you compare that to the statewide total, uh, our uh, seatbelt compliance is much, much higher than that. So what that's saying is that if you get into a crash without your seatbelt on, you're going to have a much higher risk of uh, being involved in a high severity or a, uh, a fatal crash. And so this is in that strategic highway safety plan. This is the plan that they've got for each of these different emphasis areas. These are all the different things that we're trying to uh, improve. And one of the things that I wanna point out is that two of those, one is the local road safety plans, 
is a emphasis area or a stra strategy that we're trying to use to address those roadway departure crashes. And the other ones are safety circuit rider. And those are both programs we're gonna be talking to today. And those are both programs that are geared directly towards helping local agencies uh, provide them with the resources, provide them with uh, the technical assistance in order to start mitigating some of these crashes. So we're gonna move into local road safety plans and what exactly it is. Before we kick off, I'm gonna show a short video. Some of you all may have seen this one uh, before. I know um, I saw Jerry Roshi on here and so he probably has seen this more times than, than he'd, he'd like to admit. So we're gonna watch this. It's about a three minute video. You know that the average adult has five to 20 pounds of As soon as we get done with our- At any given moment, seems- so we'll be right back. Over the last few years, FHWA estimates that approximately 40% of the nation's roadway fatalities occurred on local roads. So what are local agencies doing to change this trend and make their roads safer? They're making a plan, a local road safety plan. Local road safety plans are proven to help reduce severe crashes on local road systems. They provide a framework to identify, analyze, and prioritize roadway safety issues and countermeasures to address them. The plans all include some common steps, but they're tailored to reflect your community's needs. Let's drive through a few. It's important to identify stakeholders early on. These can include law enforcement, public health, emergency medical services, or elected officials. And it's okay to start small. This will be your team working together to save lives. Next, gather your roadway safety data. Don't have great data? You might have more than you think. You can use information like numbers of crashes, maintenance logs, safety audits, even traffic violations. The key is to start with the data you have available and grow it over time. Analyze your data to identify overrepresented crash types in areas that have the highest risk for future severe crashes. Then choose low cost, proven solutions to address those locations. The Federal Highway Administration's list of proven safety countermeasures and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's countermeasures that work are good places to start. You can implement solutions in many types of projects from everyday road maintenance to capital improvements. The result is data-driven solutions, targeted investments, and fewer severe crashes in your community. So. Start your local road safety plan today and help get people home safely. So that's just kind of a, a preview of what it is. What, what we're trying to do, again, is not just be reactive when we look at um, how are we going to identify what is where we're going to put those safety improvements, but take a strategic step towards that, have input. And then the important thing, and Nathan's going to talk about this in just a second, is making sure that it's data driven, that we are trying to focus on um, how we look at this so that we're not just going out where we think there's there's a problem that where we can show that there's a, uh, a problem and we can repeat that through a data-driven analysis program. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nathan here real quick and he's gonna just give you a real brief overview of the Highway Safety Improvement Program and how local road safety plans tie into that. And then we'll go on and learn a little bit more about those as well. All right, good morning everybody. Uh, as Adam mentioned, I'm Nathan Ridgeway. I'm with the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. I work out of the central office in Frankfurt. And our um, goal, me and two others, are to expand and uh, implement uh, safety projects using highway safety improvement funds uh, throughout the state. So, and you can progress. Next slide. So, I, when I'm ever I'm asked to come talk about highway safety improvement program, I always start with the definition. Definition is a uh, highway safety improvement program is a core federal aid program with the purpose to achieve a significant reduction in traffic fatalities and serious injury crashes on all public roads 
including non-state-owned roads and roads on travel lands. I put in bold all public roads because uh, we can use, use HSIP funds on locally owned, locally classified roads. Uh, as long as they're public, we can use those funds uh, uh, on a public road. But uh, as with other federal programs, uh, there is a few caveats or a few strings attached to this, and they're actually really good uh, strings that are attached with these funds. Uh, and, the, and the goal of these these kind of strings or, or requirements is to make sure that the project is is aligned with the strategic highway safety plan. So, as what what Adam mentioned, all the engineering strategies that were identified in that plan uh, can can be used as a HSIP project. Number two is the data-driven process. That's something that Adam touched on a little bit. Uh, we at the state, we use a pretty robust uh, data network screening statistical analysis um, to identify project locations. These projects are, or these locations are uh, locations that experience more crashes or excessive crashes compared to the other counterparts. So it's a, it's almost like a filtering process. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a lot of data on our state network and our, those 52 miles of locally owned minor major collector roads. Uh, they're also lumped into our network screening process as well. And in fact, we've used that screening process to identify locally owned locally classified projects, and we've led them in the past. Um, for instance, there was a project in Man of War, if those folks are familiar in Lexington, it's a pretty major principal arterial. It's locally owned by Lexington. Uh, we put out two or three projects uh, uh, for safety in those for uh, intersections along Man of War. The last requirement uh, for HSIP funds is the project actually has to contribute to a reduction in fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, the way we do that is we use uh, crash modification factors, crash reduction factors to help um, identify, well, if we, if we uh, have crashes and curves, we put out horizontal alignment sign, we get a 15% crash reduction. Those are kind of the projects we put out um, throughout the state. So uh, you can go ahead and progress to the last slide. So touched on the data-driven process. So HSIP, again, we use a high, go back, yeah, a robust, you know, network screen with our data. As Anna mentioned, some of our roadways that we are missing are those locally owned, locally classified uh, rural two-lane roads uh, where there is a pretty good uh, roadway departure issue. And we, we are using local road safety plans developed out of uh, KTC, Kentucky Transportation, Kentucky Transportation Center to kind of fill that gap and identify roadways in those rural uh, two-lane counties that are uh, have sig significant crash issues or uh, problems just themselves. So that's all I got, uh, Adam. Hopefully, I touched on everything you want me to touch on. Uh, that's all I've got. You got anything else you think I need to talk about or? No, I guess uh, the only thing that that I would add, and I apologize, I was chasing the dog down at the same time too, but um, you, you know the HSIP funding is available or is becoming available, and we're working through the process right now to make that funding available for local roads. Um, but in order to meet this data-driven process, you know it's not just we've identified a project we want to pave more roads, we want to do something like that for safety funds, but there's got to be a strategic uh, approach to how that project was identified. And so as we move into this realm of making those funds available for local road projects uh, and trying to kind of broaden that, uh, you know, those local road safety plans are going to be a critical piece in, in filling out that application. So uh, I think that's kind of the main point. I just want to make sure that, that everybody understands is that one, local road safety plans are going to be good regardless if you get funding from them or not. But two, they can also help you gain additional funding if you identify these high crash locations or something in your county. Did I speak out of turn on that, Nathan? Okay. Um, so then, uh, so like I said, there, the uh, local road safety plans are an initiative that's put up by FHWA. I think the first one started going 
um, live in about 2012. And uh, Kentucky is late to the game. Uh, and then I'll say slow to the game, but I'm going to blame COVID on some of our slowness. Uh, but we started about three years ago, and we were the second round of pilot states that participated in FHWA program uh, for local road safety plans. When we looked at that, there were uh, three counties that had been very active in our safety circuit rider program, and they also kind of represented a range of different uh, different states so we, or different counties. So we had Boone County, which is kind of a larger uh urbanized slash rural uh, county. We had Boyle County, which is a kind of a medium sized county. So, you know, we do have city of Danville on there and then we do have a lot of rural areas. And then we had uh, Crittenden County as well, which is a smaller county. Uh, uh, didn't have as much crash experience, but that's one of those things we want to see was if we don't have a lot of crash experiences, are there still gonna be uh, some things that we can identify. And I think that the short answer on that one is, is yes. You know, so these can apply to all sides of the counties, all populations. And, and that's really what we've been testing out here through the, the pilot program. But to look at what, if you take the local road safety plan, and this was detailed kind of in that video, but to really just boil it down, you know, what does it involve? Um, the, the first thing is we're going to find our leader or our champions and we're going to have them get together. And, and that's one of the nice things we had through the pilot uh, program is, um, you know, previously uh, our, our county engineers up in Boone County uh, and now been replaced by uh, Rob Franksman have been very involved in saying, you know, we want to participate in this. Uh, Dwayne Campbell, who's on here today, is... Um, through throughout the years of the safety circuit rider program has been a champion uh, of safety progress and really been improved and uh, coming in and, and trying to be a champion within his county. And then the same thing with the judge executive and roadway supervisor down in Crittenden County, so uh, Judge Newcomb. Uh, but they said, you know, we're going to lead this and we're going to we're going to push this on. And then we came into some of the more technical aspects, and this is where. Uh, we've got a good partnership between the local governments and the technology transfer program at UK where we can help provide some of this analysis. So we first go through and we look at um, uh, crash hazard analysis in uh, on our roadway. So we're going to look at our crashes. And if we don't have a lot of um, crashes, we can also look at where are our hazard locations in there as well. Once we look at that, we're going to determine our emphasis areas. And what those emphasis areas are, similar to what we saw in the strategic highway safety plan, is that we either have high crash types. So we, you know, we might see a lot of intersection related crashes. We might see a lot of uh, roadway departure crashes or single vehicle crashes. But some of the other things that we're finding in the counties is we've got frequent hazards. Uh, and we'll talk about those as well. You know, uh, Do you have just a you know, some issues with our signing. A lot of times uh, we've got some counties that they've kind of put up signing and it just kind of grows and nobody ever takes any down. So we need to kind of come back and say, okay, you know, let's revisit signing through here. Uh, on some other roadways uh, we've identified, we've got a lot of roads that used to be state roads and they had a lot of guardrail 30 years ago and that guardrail is in disrepair. It may not even be needed at this time. And so we say, do we need to upgrade this guardrail on a lot of these roadways? Do we need to just remove it so we can remove a fixed object? Uh, and then, you know, working in Boyle County, we've got a lot of roadways where the roads gradually widened out, but we've got some choke points where we have our culverts and our road top, uh, drainage tiles. So trying to say, you know, this is a consistent problem and we're going to use this local road safety plan to identify that and then go through it. The next step. Yeah, a comment in the chat box. They want us to know, what did you say, Rob Frax? Fraxman is doing now? Uh, a county engineer up in uh, Boone County. And I hope I didn't get a different Rob name mixed up with the last name because I haven't seen anybody in a year for in debt. So. Is he working with the, she wants to know what he, what he's doing. In the a county engineer for Boone County. So um, 
So then we're going to go through and identify those improvements. And we're going to show you some of the resources that we've got in order to uh, identify those improvements and then finally implement them and revisit our plan. So um, to go through on our, our crash analysis, some of the basic things we're going to do is just, you know, look at what kind of crash frequency do we have? Uh, and this is some crash analysis that was completed for Boyle County. And it kind of starts to speak to the issues that we've got on our county roads. If you look uh, between our county route system, city streets, uh, KY, and then U.S. routes, you know, county roads in terms of crash frequency are some of our lowest. If you look at some of our severity, the county road system has actually got some of the highest severity. So while we might not have as many crashes occurring on those roadways, if you do get into a crash, you've got a probably a higher chance of being injured or having fatal crashes on those than you do even on our higher speed uh, Kentucky and US routes. And then finally, if you look at, you know, what is happening, you know, the majority, it kind of as we would expect is our single vehicle crash patterns followed by some intersections, which we're seeing are more at our stop controlled intersections, either two way stop control or our T intersections, where we've got rear end and angle crashes as well. And so this is data that we pulled together and we've provided to Boyle County. And I want to just make clear, this is data that we've got. Uh, it's, it's a database that's maintained by the state uh, police. We have access to it. You can access it from a public portal, but if you are just curious and you say, I wanna know what type of crashes I've got in my county, or if you might go through and you say, you know, I wanna know where my crashes are occurring, uh, and this is a map again that we prepared for Boyle County is showing where our crashes are on the county road system. This is stuff that we can easily provide to you. We've got access to it, we've got that database. And so if you need it, you can call us up and you can say, you know, I'd like to know where my crashes are in my county. I'd like to know where my crashes are in my district. And through the safety circuit rider program and our technical assistance, this is something that we can provide you now. Uh, so this isn't just a plan start a plan and then three years later we'll have uh, something for you. This is, you know, we've got a lot of these pieces and parts that are already available and it's available through uh, the technology transfer program. So, uh, you know, the next thing after we see where, what happens with our crashes, we see where are the crashes occurring? And you can see a couple of things. There is a fatal crash um, over here. We've got uh, quite a few crashes down here on this one. And then you can see up in the North end of the County we've got a few other crashes as well. So these are the areas where we're really going to kind of focus on and say, okay, what kind of problems do we have in there? One of the other things that we did is you, you heard us talk about the issue of, we don't have a lot of collector functionally classified roadways. And instead what we said is, are there any roadways in the county that aren't just county roads. It's not just a gravel road leading back a farm that two people may live on and you don't have any uh, uh, traffic volume on it, but are there these roads that connect different ends of the county that might connect two different state routes that get a lot more traffic, but they might not have seen the improvements for them. And so we identified what we're calling our county collector roadways. And these are our major county roads and you can kind of see them highlighted here. And uh, Alum Springs Cross Bike. You can see this is a roadway that connects two state routes, and um, the same with Cream Ridge Road. This one goes back and serves a large uh, population of people through developments, and the same way with with Mitchell Lane and Webster through here. These are areas where it's not just local road traffic. We've got some cut through. It might be the easiest or quickest way through the county. And when we identify these, and then we go look at our crash analysis is that we saw just by identifying about 10 roads, we were able to capture 76% of our lane departure crashes and 80% of our fatal or serious injury uh, lane departure crashes or roadway departure crashes. So by focusing on these roadways that we know, you know, a lot of people have, are cutting through or a lot of people are using, we're able to get, you know, maybe a 10th of the roadway system, but 80% of the, uh, the crashes on those roadways. So we went through a hazard analysis then on this, and said, okay, what are the problems on these roadways? Do they have dangerous curves? Do they have uh, dangerous vertical curvature uh, where we might lose sight distance? Are the operating speeds too high? 
Uh, is there a lot of traffic on it, a little bit of traffic on it? What's the clear zone look like? What's that road size? So if you do depart the roadway, is there a higher trend? Um, is there a higher chance that you might end up striking an object or rolling over your vehicle? And then what's the roadway width? So when what we would typically do and what we do on state roads is we've got data for this. We've got vans that have driven our state roads. We've cataloged all this. We've got a database and we can go ahead and just go ahead and, and measure this. On the local road system, we don't have that kind of data. And that's one of the biggest challenges we've got for local roads is we don't have a lot of data to drive some of this data-driven analysis that Nathan's uh, talked about that's required in order to be available for HSIP fundings. So what we did for this one is we just got our county engineers, we've got our first responders who are out there looking at crashes, we got our road maintenance crews, and we just sat down with the map and we said, okay, on this roadway, on Allen Spring, Springs Cross Pipe, does it have high, medium, or low volume? Does it have a lot of bad vertical curves uh, or, or none? And we just measured these high, medium, low, and that allowed us to get kind of a snapshot of some of the problems that we've got on that roadway. And then we can um, analyze that. So if you've got, uh, you know, six different hazard uh, factors that we're looking at and you've got all six, that roadway is probably going to go up to the top of the list. Whereas if, you know, you don't, it's a straight road, you don't have many vertical curves, operating speed speed is appropriate, low ADT, and clear zone looks good, then that's going to start moving down to the bottom of the list. So this allows us to get a snapshot in a very short amount of time without going through a lot of rigorous data collection uh, for this process. And then once we did that, we looked at what crashes we had on the roadways, we looked at what hazards we had identified, and then we were able to come up with an overall ranking for our roadways. And so what you can see here is our top four is uh, Gobby Lane, which is the one that we had identified over here with a, uh, a fatal crash. And that's one that had uh, serious uh, vertical curve issues where we restricted side distance, but it was also narrow. Uh, Waterworks Road up in uh, this area where we had a lot of crashes because we had a lot of access points going through there. Alum Springs Cross Pike, and this is an area you can see it runs right through here. That's probably one of our highest volume roadways we've got in the uh, in the county. So, you know, based on that, <clears throat> we're able to uh, identify and say, okay, these are the worst roads we've got from a hazard standpoint. These are the worst roads we've got from a crash standpoint. And then we're able to come in and uh, start identifying some improvements for that. So, What we did after we identified and prioritized this list is then we went out and we did a road safety audit. And the way that we do the road safety audits is we basically drive down the roadway. And if we see a hazard, uh, we use a online uh, ArcGIS online uh, mapping system. We're able to take a picture of it. We're able to type in the notes of what those crashes are, what those problems are. And then we're able to uh, identify that and come back later and put together our final project. So some of the things that uh, we saw in Boyle County, number one issue that we saw kind of all over the place is, is we've got a lot of edge drop-offs. That's either where we've got a low shoulder or we've got some places like you can see in this picture up here where we've got a culvert coming through there and it's right up against the road edge. And so we've got uh, these drop-offs. So when we look at then where's our emphasis areas, where do we need to start trying to identify what improvements to put in place? These edge drop-offs is gonna become one of our, our higher, um, our higher uh, emphasis areas and what we're gonna concentrate both our improvements and our funding. One of the other things that we saw routinely on these was curve signing. A lot of these are low volume roadways. And so if you look at the MUTCD, we're not required to put out signing, but then if we start looking at the fact that our volumes are starting to increase and that we start to have this crash exposure and we may not have local traffic anymore, then maybe curve signing becomes a more important issue. And we wanna start, especially on this system, start trying to put out some of our curve uh, signs. And so really where we come through and then we say, you know, what, what improvement do we do there? If we've got roadway departure crashes, if we've got these, these culverts, what do we need to do? And so where we really point 
two on that one is the FHWA proven safety countermeasures. And the proven safety countermeasures is a, a list of safety countermeasures or safety improvements that has been uh, implemented widely across by many states. And the FHWA comes again and kind of put it together and said, you know what, we know that these things work. You don't have to go out and experiment with something, but we know that proper signing helps when we go have roadway departure crashes on our curves. Uh, we know that, um, you know, fixing edge drop offs can help with our single vehicle run off the road crashes. So these are a resource available from FHWA. And, and again, the same thing, these are available now. So, you know, if you've got an issue that you're struggling with, uh, but maybe you don't know exactly how to uh, address that, you can come to the technology transfer program and then we can help you and put you in contact with these um, FHWA proven safety countermeasures so that you can go implement them in uh, your state. You don't need to uh, wait for a, a local road safety plan. These are things that are available now. A couple of things, the way that the proven safety countermeasures work is you can see, you know, roadside design improvements at curves. Uh, and what it does is it gives you some of the crashes that typically occur and then tells you a little bit more information about it and how to implement uh, those proven safety countermeasures. So that's really what we're trying to do is identify, you know, where these issues are coming at and then what is something that we know is going to work uh, so that we can go through there. A couple other references that you might want to look at is the uh, Proven Safety Countermeasures website for FHWA. Uh, there's also what's called a CMF Clearinghouse, which is a Crash Modification Factor Clearinghouse. And we'll talk about those in a second, but what Crash Modification Factors are is, is improvements that have been tested out and evaluated so that we've got a really good idea on if I put a sign on this curve, how much is that going to reduce crashes? And uh, the clearinghouse has got that data and we'll talk about this in just one second, but what that allows us to do is if I say, I'm gonna reduce crashes by 50% on this curve by putting out good signing, then we can identify what that benefit cost ratio is. And so if spending a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars to improve signing on a curve, if I'm gonna save one crash, I'm probably gonna have a very good benefit cost ratio because I'm gonna be uh, doing. And what we wanna do and what the local road safety plan helps us do is identify where's our money best spent. You know, if I've got, we realize that we've got limited funding and what we wanna do is impact the most crashes and get the best return on that investment. So that's really what we do with, with that one. A couple other features, you know, how, that you can look for for references is the highway safety manual. Um, NHTSA has countermeasures that work and the, um, Kentucky Strategic Highway Safety Plan is another one. There's a lot of different places out there you can look at for references. Finally, the other place you can do uh, is just come to the uh, Technology Transfer Program and Nicole put the link I see up there in the chat bar. So if you do have a question, you can fill out that form and we'll be in contact with you uh, on that. So uh, looking at crash modification factors, and I just saw that misspelled this one, but uh, crash modification factors, like I said, those are research-based safety performance metrics. Uh, it's something that's been tested time and time again. We realize that they work. We know how well they work. Uh, and what the crash modification factor is, is it's just a multiplication factor. So uh, you might have a crash modification factor of 0.5, and what that means is that it reduces crashes by 50%. So you take the number of crashes you've got and you multiply it by your crash modification factor. And that tells you uh, how many crashes you're gonna have in the future. So really simple to apply. And if we know how much a crash essentially costs us, then what we can do is we can figure out, well, how much savings do I get? So if I have a property damage only crash and I can, and I can save two of those a year, and the average cost of a property damage only cost crash is say $10,000. By putting up something with a 50% reduction factor, I can save $20,000. And if that's something low cost, like a sign, like going back and cutting up vegetation so we can increase uh, site distance, then we can see that you know a little bit of investment can have a very big impact 
uh, on our crash performance and give us a very good rate of return. So that's how we use those uh, to determine our safety benefit. What I wanna do is talk a little bit about the types of countermeasures that we typically target. And the reason that we target these crash, uh, these countermeasures is because they have a really high benefit and a, a really high benefit cost ratio. They have high benefit and they're very low cost. Uh, two of those um, areas, one is those that are 100% federal match. So what we're trying to identify through the Highway Safety Improvement Program, through our local road safety plans are, uh, if I use HSIP funds, which is a federal, uh, a federal fund, does the local government have to put any money up to that? Some, on some improvements, uh, HSIP funds can be eligible for 80%, and then the county has to come up with the other 20. Uh, but on some items, it's 100% match. So we could use 100% of our HSIP funds for that, and we don't have to look at uh, county resources. So that's the first area we're going to look at. And then some of the other areas that we focus on are just what are those maintenance activities that we do day in and day out, and maybe we can just reprioritize those. So that's where we get into, uh, you know, maybe our resurfacing program, maybe we get into our vegetation management, maybe we get into patching and things like that. Uh, so that's the other one. It's like we're out there anyway, but with our local road safety plans, we can just kind of reorder how we go after that. Uh, number one, uh, this is some pictures that we took up in Boone County. And like I said, these are a lot of state roads that had guardrail up at one time, they're higher order road and they got pushed over to the county or they're traded over to the county system. This guardrail has probably been up for about 30 years. You can see, um, you know, we're starting to slide down the hill. The guardrail is very low in a lot of places because as we've resurfaced, we've raised the roadway, but we haven't raised uh, the guardrail. And so what this does is one, it's not providing an effective barrier and two, it's essentially acting like a fixed object on our roadway. So, we can go in and identify these locations where we may need to go and replace guardrail. And there might even be some places where we've got guardrail that is no longer needed, that uh, the hazard it was blocking is gone, but we've still got the guardrail. And now we've just got a fixed object in our roadway. Uh, one of the other things that we've got is pavement markings. Uh, they are 100% um, federal match. And a lot of our roadways, that we've got are very narrow roadways on our local system. And this is some of the guidance that we've, we've come up recently is that for the narrow roadways on our 16 feet or our six under 20 feet, uh, oftentimes we'll leave those unmarked. But what we're seeing is by putting edge line only on those roadways, we can really go in and reduce uh, roadway departure crashes. The main concern we had on those narrow roadways is if you put in our edge lines, does that then increase the, uh, the risk of head-on crashes if you've got a two-way roadway? What we actually found is that by putting in edge lines on these narrow roadways, one, the risk of roadway departure is much higher than the risk of head-on crashes because we don't have a lot of volume, so there's not a lot of opportunity to hit an oncoming vehicle. And second, we actually saw head-on crashes decrease. And the reason that we think that the head-on crashes decrease is because by providing that edge line, we can provide a little bit more guidance so people know how far off that roadway they can get when they're passing another vehicle. So uh, under 16 feet, uh, edge lines are permitted. And most of the time, the, we would say they're probably recommended if you've got roadway departure crashes. And then when we can get into 16 to 20 foot roadways, uh, Either we have an edge line or we have a center line. And in a vast majority of our local roads where we've got these lower volumes, we see that we probably have a much better benefit from edge line only uh, than we would by putting in the center line. Again, because our greatest risk are these roadway departure crashes and providing that uh, edge guidance can go a long way uh, with that. So, you know, this is an example of an edge line only roadway. Uh, I think this one is down in uh, Simpson County, but if you put in just an edge line uh, on a roadway, what we see, we have a crash modification factor of eight, uh, 0.85, so we can reduce crashes by about 15% by putting in uh, the edge line only. Center line roadways, 
Uh, we really just recommend those on our higher volume roadways. So, you know, when you have a greater chance of hitting an oncoming vehicle than you would think maybe running off the roadway. So really pushing the edge lines uh, due to that proven uh, safety reduction, but uh, also uh, center lines for some roadways are more uh, appropriate as well. And then I don't know how it is in other states, but- uh, Somebody for... has a question, I believe. Someone has a hand okay. up. Okay. Sorry, Eric. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. Thank you. I, I do have a question related to those guidelines uh, slide that you had. Uh, yeah. So, question about the um, regarding the ADT. So, um, if we're doing some traffic forecasting and we identify a roadway where those ADT numbers we do anticipate being higher. But as of current numbers, we may not, you know, look at implementing edge lines um, right now. But the question about these numbers in the future kind of tell us maybe we want to consider, does that kind of put us in a proactive position? Uh, is this something recommended? Is there any practices on that based upon just projected numbers? future numbers so if, if how far out are you going like 20 year projected numbers or uh 10 max oh um what i would say and i know there's some other people in here as well that uh, might be able to uh chime in so jerry if you if you got any thoughts let me know um when we say required uh that required is based on MUTCD guidance. Okay, so that that's that's a shall statement. Um, if you are only going out ten years and you're going to be tripping over that thousand vehicle threshold, you know, there's not a whole lot of difference between 900 vehicles an hour and 1,100 vehicles an hour. So, if you're seeing that it's going to be required, it may be. I would think it might be worthwhile to get and start putting it into that, uh, put it in the queue. So. What um, what we see really where we've got the most benefit to gain is on the roadways that are never going to meet those required ones, but we can, you know, those really low volume roads, those are the ones where you need to kind of get those on the list and maybe bump them up. But I'd say if you're getting close, even in the next 10 years, you're going to get it, you, you probably want to be proactive and get it on that list and go ahead and put it up there. Thank you. Uh, so one of the other things that we uh, we talk about when we start talking about pavement markings as well is uh, we've really been pushing stop bars. Uh, and it's I know it's kind of a four letter word or a, yeah, two four letter words when you start talking stop bars because they can provide a, a large maintenance headache uh, especially if you're in a snow state, you know, they can get scraped off and things like that. But there's a lot of locations where we say we don't need to put stop bars everywhere. But if you've got a high crash location, you know, uh, a stripe on the pavement can go a long way towards addressing those. Some of the other areas we see when we've got intersections and curves, such as you see this location here, one of the problems that we see is that if you're coming up to stop, at that intersection because you're in a curve, it may be really difficult to understand where exactly you need to stop. So then we start encroaching upon the travel lanes or vehicles that are traveling through that curve don't have any guidance through it and they might start encroaching upon the side street. So we don't have a good differentiator. Um, we have, sometimes we have really wide minor street approaches. Uh, if you have multiple uh, lanes or if you start putting in medians and we start just having a lot of pavement out there and nobody really knows where to go that's another location and then finally what uh, we've been encouraging is when you have high hazard locations so if you've got a county road that's intersecting a high volume high speed state road and it's stop controlled you really want to do everything you can at that point to make sure that somebody doesn't run through uh, that stop sign and increase the visibility and stop bars and pavement markings like such as that go a long way uh, towards meeting that. So uh, this is an example. You can see this picture up here in the top. Uh, this is just, uh, I'd call it Photoshop, but it's actually Microsoft Paint. But this is just kind of what it can look like if you put in a stop bar at that location. So just 
give you an idea, we got a lot more guidance. So now a vehicle on the primary roadway kind of knows where to stay. And then those vehicles coming up, they know where to stop as well. So they're not encroaching upon it. So stop bars can go a really long way, especially for some of our intersection problems that we, that we may be having. Another emphasis area that we, that we kind of see over and over is just upgrading or signing. And the reason I like this picture is that if you go out and you know you drive your row, as you say, everything looks fine. We know, people know how uh, to drive through there. But if you look at the bottom picture, and if you imagine you're driving along that roadway, you can see you've got pavement markings that are showing you where that curve is. You've got uh, guardrail that's showing you that curve. You've got that whole backdrop of the rock cut and the trees behind you that says, you know, there's something up in front of you. You need to curve along this roadway. If you're coming through at night, the only thing that you've got along that roadway that's telling you that there's a curve there are these signs. And that's why when we look at our horizontal alignment signing, um, especially at nighttime, that is where it's critical that we provide that additional guidance uh, so that somebody can travel uh, through their roadway. Just kind of another uh, example, you know, before, after this is, uh, roadway that, or a sign, somebody made their own stop a hot head sign here, you know, just upgrading that to METCD compliant signs. Um, this is one we found where not really quite sure. It's, we've got some uh, chevrons on the inside indicating the wrong way to turn and just getting that signing right so that we provide proper guidance uh, through that curve as well. These are the type of things that we're looking for. Easy wins, low cost measures, that have that high safety benefit uh, when we start to try and identify, uh, identify projects. So some of the other things that we may look at is, you know, for our maintenance activities, are there some just fixed objects in the clear zone that we can take out? Uh, we're not gonna be moving utility poles, but can we move that tree that's like encroaching right on uh, the edge of the roadway? Uh, a lot of it can go to vegetation maintenance. This is a, a rural county we've got in Kentucky. Just on the other side of that, that uh, picture on the left, there's a bridge that's hiding in there. We've got a curb you can't see around, and then you got a bridge on the other side of it, and we had some impacts uh, over there. Coming through with a crew and a weed eater, you can see now we've got much better visibility approaching that curve. Uh, and these are just some of those things that everybody's mowing, everybody's weed eating, and we're gonna be busy doing it. Can we use this local road safety plan? Can we use this evaluation to say, you know what, this is probably one of those first places I should hit, or maybe I need to hit this twice a year as opposed to once a year or increase our frequency so we can make sure that we uh, keep this one clear uh, through here. This is another location, um, is Doan County Forces, and just grading the roadway back and you can see how much more it's opened up our sight distance for curves through there. So if you can see, if you're trying to turn uh, out of this intersection, you couldn't see hardly anything before. That second picture, we're actually sitting a lot further back from the stop bar than in the first. And just using some equipment, pull on that back. Low cost, basically we're just talking cost of labor uh, and some time for some activities uh, such as this. This is another one, just merely taking the stump up. You know, you're reducing a, a, or eliminating a fixed object. And while you're eliminating that fixed object, you're also increasing the sight distance. And a lot of times people say, you know, we can't work on, um, we can't work on private property. This might be outside of the right of way. All of these examples are improvements that were done on private property. And if you think about it, if you're this homeowner and you got a large stump in your front yard, uh, you probably welcome somebody coming to help you uh, take that stump out as opposed to uh, having to pay for it or mess with it yourself. So just by talking with those property owners, a lot of times we see there's a lot of opportunity uh, to go ahead and make some of these improvements. Because if anybody knows the hazards that they create, it's the people who live right there. And, and that's often what we see is that a lot of people are typically very open and aware of the safety issues uh, that some of these things have. Uh, another one is just looking at uh, drop off repairs. You know, if you drop a wheel off of the side of the roadway where you've got an edge drop off, it's very difficult to get back on. And sometimes just the power of getting back on the roadway can actually send you over to the other side of the road for a, uh, a single vehicle crash or roadway departure crash on the opposite side of the road. 
just by providing some uh, shouldering, some very minor shouldering, either whether it be asphalt, gravel, gravel with a, a tack coat, uh, can go a long way to when that edge, your wheel drops off, it's much easier to get back onto uh, the roadway there. So uh, a couple of things, you know, we talk about, you know, all of this stuff, and I, I think there's some good, good things in there, and we'd like to see more local governments, counties, and cities get involved in promoting safety or just prioritizing safety when we go through our everyday activities. And so how you get involved, one, and you probably get tired of me saying this, but the technology transfer program has a lot of resources available now. Uh, it's paid through through the Safety Circuit Rider program that we are available uh, to provide you crash data. If you need uh, proven safety countermeasures, we can provide that to you. We also go out and work with you one-on-one. -on -one. If you've got an issue uh, that you need some help on that you may not know the best way to address it, or maybe you do have a good way to address it, but you just want an outside opinion so you can go to your magistrates or your judge executive and say, you know, we got a second opinion on that. We've got uh, programs in place that we can come do that for you. So we can do this piece by piece. Uh, at the same time, if you would like to start making this priority through here so that we have a, uh, you develop your own local road safety plan so that you can start getting eligible for this highway safety improvement programs, uh, we are wrapping up our local road safety plan and pilot project right now. And through the next year, we're going to start looking at identifying um six to 10 counties that can participate in the next round of local road safety plans. So uh, what we uh, we see with that is probably at the end of this year, we will be having applications. So if you're interested, we're going to have applications that are available so you can uh, kind of identify what safety initiatives you all have undertaken and uh, what your needs are. So we'll be looking at that. And then spring of 2022, so about a year from now, we're looking at hosting a, a conference or a peer exchange when uh, those counties that have already participated in it uh, within Kentucky, they're going to share their thoughts. And then you can also share, uh, you know, some of your challenges and, and talk with them to get kind of that one on one uh, hands on. So then at summer 2022, we're planning on kicking off that second round of our local road safety plan. So uh, if you are a county magistrate, county judge executive, a road supervisor, a county engineer, and you're interested in this, um, one, you can just send us a, a um, question or, or an inquiry through the technical assistance link that Nicole's put up. Uh, you can email me. I've got my email on the next slide. Uh, or just look out for our link newsletter, and it's going to have that information for when the next round of local road safety plans are coming up as well. So um, this is the, uh, the Tech Assist uh, form. So that's what that link that Nicole's posted there. Uh, it'll take you to this web page, and you can just fill that out, and then it goes directly to me so we can see uh, what your request is, and we'll be in contact with you. And I think that is all I've got for today. Does anybody have any other questions or, or needs they'd like to discuss? You can just take yourself off mute if you want to ask the question or you can put it in the chat box and I can read it. Thank you, Bernadette. Yes, thank you, Bernadette. Okay, well, if we don't have any questions, thank you, Adam, for joining us this morning and sharing your presentation. Thank you all for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedules to attend the uh, webinar today. I have put a link in the uh, chat box for your evaluation. So please send, uh, fill that link out so that we can issue your certificates. Your certificates will be emailed out to you on Friday after you complete your evaluation. Um, and sometimes check your junk mail because sometimes that does go to the junk mail. So um, it lands there. We'll stay on a couple of minutes if anybody has questions. Uh, we will we do record these uh, webinars and um, we will have it on our YouTube channel. I will drop that in the chat box for you also. All right, there's our YouTube channel. And also if you have any questions about uh, any of our courses, you can go to our webinar 
and get a list of our courses and register for our courses. I'm going to put that link in the in the chat box as well. And if you all have any questions for us, we're going to stay on for a couple of minutes. Also, Ms. Martha Horseman has joined us for a few minutes. Martha, do you want to say anything before everybody leaves out? Good morning. Um, I, I, we're fortunate to have Adam on our team as our safety circuit rider and also working on our local road safety plan. So he is a great resource and I would encourage you to contact him, even if you have a spot you want him um, to check out in your area. Um, he's a frequent road traveler. So um, thanks again for joining us. And we, we keep adding webinars to our, our website and um, uh, we'll have several more throughout the year. So we hope you um, participate with us again.